So I've been a mentor at Made in Her Image for over like three years now since I've been in LA and the community that Made in Her Image has given me has been so uplifting, so empowering and um, helped me feel like less alone in this industry. Like there are other organizers that I can go to for personal help, but also like being able to invest in the future and the future of filmmaking, which I believe is young black and brown women um, has been really empowering for me as well and providing those technical resources that are usually so hard to um, uh, find within reach. A big part of uh, how I implement diversity is through my mentorship and I provide free online um, cinematography courses to young black and brown girls worldwide. It was so cool. We even like made it to Brazil, which was crazy. <laughs> and so uh, just making the feeling and the power of putting black and brown women behind the camera universal and accessible has been a big part of my process and using social media as a tool to get us all a seat at the table has been really helpful for me through my journey and I want to kind of normalize that amongst other black and brown filmmakers as well. When I started working in in the theater, which was my first entree into this world, I was probably one of the few South Asian for people of South Asian descent I ever encountered in productions. So I, I guess I, you know, and I'm a first generation American. So that's always influenced my perspective. Most recently in my career, I had really the great pleasure of, I did both a Bollywood feature film and a, a stage musical in India. So that's the first time I ever got to work on actual Indian content, not American content. But the other thing that's been kind of exciting recently is I've been able to do plays written by Indian artists or American artists of Indian descent in the United States. A group of designers um, actually led by Jane Muskie started Equity Through Design. People with diverse backgrounds mentor younger students, um, students and people um, in high school in the New York City. And the main focus, the, the main purpose of it is to, to show them by example that they see someone who looks like themselves in a position of production designer, costume designer, showrunner. And it opens up, I think, a world for people. They realize a lot of, you know, people, especially in immigrant families, they don't even know, wouldn't even think that they could do something like this or don't, don't even know that it's a possibility. So I think it's that that kind of visibility is, is, is the most important thing. Just uh, when you see people like yourselves in those positions, you can see yourself doing that. And that's what makes it happen. I've been really, 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 really tremendously excited about having the opportunity at work, you know, day in and day out these days to show minorities on television and to be able to tell these people stories because it makes a massive world of difference to be able to see yourself as a kid, right, on television and see yourself represented as like someone who's normal or like someone who's cool. Trust me, when I was a little kid, like brown people on TV were not cool. Um, and it made it that much harder for me to be growing up. Um, and uh, it's, it's really dope these days to see that we're actually able to um, elevate and lift up people whose stories have been ignored for so long and marginalized and instead to make them, you know, the heroes of stories. Everyone is looking for directors of color, women directors. Um, and the fact of the matter is there aren't that many that they call qualified, um, which is their way of saying there just haven't been that many people who've gotten into the pipeline and had the opportunity to move up. And you know, one thing I've been doing for years has been active uh, with the Directors Guild diversity committees and recently was elected as a co-chair of the Asian American Committee there at the DGA. And we work really hard to empower, uh, you know, our committee, but like we work with all of the other committees and try to like help raise up as many people as we can and to help knock on doors and shake the power structure a little bit to be like, hey, there's a whole bunch of people out here you've left out in the cold and have ignored for a very long time. Um, and it's really rewarding to see that the tide is turning and people are listening and people are finally starting to get opportunities that they should have been having 10, 15, 20, well, however many years ago. On the Record presents the haunting story of the brilliant 90s hip hop executive, Drew Dixon, as she grapples with her decision as one of the first women of color to come forward in the wake of the Me Too movement and to publicly accuse powerful music mogul, Russell Simmons of sexual assault. The film follows Drew in the weeks and months leading up to her decision to go public with her story in the New York Times and all that happens in the aftermath of this life altering decision. 
It's a profound examination of racial injustice and the wrenching double bind faced by survivors who are women of color. My privilege has allowed me to be in a position where I can make these kind of films. And so I'm using that power to do what I can to amplify and raise other voices. It was a co-collaborative effort with a biracial team of filmmakers. And um, what we were grateful for was to have the opportunity to let these voices, that give a platform to these voices to speak unadulterated. And you hear them in their own time and in their own way describing their plight and their analysis of their plight. We're all gonna have to work together to overcome systemic racism. And the way that Amy Ziering and Kirby Dick, the directors of On the Record, used their relationships, resources, access, expertise, and privilege to center the stories of black women in this film, and then to fight for us, to put it all on the line when we lost our executive producer and our distribution partner, is a great example of what true allyship looks like. I'm so grateful to HBO Max for picking up this film, and I hope that people will take 95 minutes out of their lives to begin to understand the 400-year struggle of Black women in America, especially those of us who are survivors of sexual violence, and the double bind we face in coming forward. Some of my more recent works include um, The Great Human Odyssey and uh, Equestory the Horse, both uh, miniseries and PBS and CBC. This most recent project was Lifetime's Shaking Its Best Holiday. Um, and I think what was really neat about this project is this was Lifetime's first foray into, uh, you know, going to Asian American culture with uh, an all a, a principal cast that was mostly Asian American. Uh, a lot of the key creatives, including myself, were, were Asian. Um, I think what I appreciated about this was that, you know, I could really relate to the stories and to the character having grown up in sort of, you know, in contemporary Canada, the clash between traditional values and sort of the contemporary life that I wanted to live. You know, they were really committed to telling the story authentically using, uh, using a cast and crew that represented, the, that truly represented the story that they were trying to tell. I'm really fortunate to be a mentor with the Canadian Film Centre and uh, the Screen Composers Guild of Canada. And I think that, you know, through those opportunities, I've seen how important it is for, um, for emerging composers to have access to mentorship and to have access to opportunities. I think, especially when you're talking about uh, diversity and inclusion, it brings those sort of things that bring us one step closer to equity. To be a mentor, to pro help provide opportunities to the next generation, I think that way we're gonna have a Hollywood that really act and that tells stories about society that you and I live in. Hi, my name is Paisley Fields. I'm a non-binary country musician and recording artist. Pre-pandemic, I was on the road a lot, touring to different small towns, big cities all over the country. And there's one show in particular that stands out in relation to diversity and inclusion. And it was in Cincinnati. I played at this festival. And afterwards, we were at the merch table and this mom and her son came up. And, you know, they bought some merch. And later, the mom came back and told us that her son had just come out to them this week. Um, and so that was a really special moment for me. And I know for him too, to see a queer person on stage playing country music. It's been challenging finding ways to be creative during this pandemic when we're all stuck at home. But one of the projects I'm working on that I'm really excited about is this new queer animated series that I'm developing with some friends. And one of my friends is here now, Amanda Van Nostrand. Thank you, Paisley. Uh, my name is Amanda Van Nostrand and I am a writer and comedian. And I am so excited to be working on this animated project with our friends over at Confidential Creative. I feel like we're in this like really unique opportunity to bring these queer voices to a larger platform where they deserve to be heard and their stories deserve to be told. Two summers ago, I was uh, fortunate enough to be featured in uh, Spider-Man Far From Home. I feel strongly about trans representation, I think specifically because I had very little of it growing up. And I think the coming out process is so much more complicated when you don't have a vision of what you might look like in the future. You know, the more you see something, the more familiar with it you are, you know, the more humanized the people who experience that or, who, you know, identify that way are to you. And it creates much more safety in the world for those people. You know, I, I really want trans people to be normalized in people's lives for them to be able to say, you know, maybe I don't know a trans person who's either out to me or at all, but 
I know what it looks like to see someone trans. I'm not afraid of it. Looking back and seeing where we could be and seeing where we are, I'm, I'm so excited by that. But I'm also elated and energized by the concept that we could be miles and miles ahead in the next year. You know what I mean? That we can, we can develop these nuanced, incredible stories that, that paint people that are trans and queer complexly and, and interestingly and not always tragically. And so, you know, I have a lot of optimism and I'm really, really excited to see what happens. In all my work, I hope to, and my goal is to write about Jewish people. Um, Jew Jewish people are a huge minority in the world. Uh, the, I believe the Jewish people make up 0.02% of the world's population. And even though there are many Jewish writers, um, the Jewish representation on screen in stories is not shown as much. Even though there are a lot of people who are Jewish behind the scenes, our stories are not often shown in television and movies. And when they are, it's not always a diverse representation of the Jewish experience. His Historically, Jewish people may be just seen as Orthodox or maybe very culturally Jewish in New York City. And there's so many more types of Jewish people and Jewish stories to be told that aren't always seen. But there are also Jews of color. There are Sephardi Jews, and they have different ways of expressing their Judaism and celebrating their culture. And I hope that I can be part of sharing that journey and showing what that's like for them. I remember when um, I was in film school, I had a roommate. Um, she was maybe one or two years older than me. And she would look at my drawings and she would always ask me, why do you draw? Why do you always draw white people? And I was <laughs> like, what? I just draw characters. And just having my roommate ask me that made me think, well, actually, why don't I tell stories about my people, my experiences, my country, whatever? Uh, diverse representation in stories or in animation really means stories told by non-traditional white Hollywood males, you know. Uh, for instance, stories told by Africans. We are from the African continent. Or stories told by women, you know. Uh, there's not a lot of, of women in, in animation, you know. Uh, or stories told by medical docs. I never thought that as a medical doctor I could actually uh, tell stories. Uh, but here, you know, three teaspoons, we were able to tell a story from a medical perspective about a medical concept. So I think diversity also includes those things that we never even think about. But there's also around people with disabilities, you know, um, or, or people with a different outlook on spirituality or, or religion and so on. So that, that is how I look at diversity uh, in a nutshell. Um, what I hope for um, from my side uh, that people would get from our films is number one, to know that they can take care of themselves in terms of our medical animation films mm -hmm. and that it's actually not as intimidating as it seems. And then two, for our non-medical stuff um, like the FAM, to actually learn and see a different culture and also see that, yes, these are people who are from South Africa and they've, they have um, different nuances in their day to day, but actually we're really all the same. My name is Erman Brody. I am the founder of Ermontourage. I am a screenwriter, but also am known for producing Hollywood events. We gather filmmakers in the industry who are mostly people of color, women, of course, uh, and we do a lot of events that focus on diversity related issues. In addition to events, we put on film and screenplay contests that are specifically catered to diversity. So we hope to look for more new talents that represent people that look like us. One of my goals is to make Hollywood more accessible to our audience, which is full of filmmakers uh, and aspiring actors and writers. Since 2015, um, I started the production portraying Asian American actors, artists uh, through Asian American stories, through more Asian American audience in New York City. So what I realized um, in terms of Asian American theater, to be honest, there's a lot of Asian American stories that are not presented yet. And uh, we are mining the stories and decorating with the new uh, development stuff and uh, hoping that once COVID is over, we can present more Asian American stories to the mainstream. We also have to make our own pipeline to portray our stories. And I think it is, uh, we cannot be discouraged by the reality. Uh, we just have to keep going on and keep saying our voices that will 
give other generations uh, the hope that we can talk about story by ourselves. And I think that's important that how by POC to make the movement to tell their own stories. Hi, this is Ira Cohen. I'm the president of Dignified Home Loans. And I just wanted to say what a pleasure it is and an honor it is for us to be able to support the Diversity Summit in Hollywood. Um, we obviously believe in diversity. We try to have it in our own business and we know how important it is. So uh, I wanna congratulate all of you and uh, continue the good work. Thank you so much.